Aung San was the man most responsible for Burma's eventual independence in 1947 and is often considered the father of the nation and a hero in modern Myanmar. Unfortunately, after negotiating Burma's independence and winning a national election in 1947, Aung San's life met a violent end, and he was not able to see his country's independence or serve as its first president. In this video, we will not only examine the most commonly held account of Aung San's murder, but we will also consider two other possibilities that have been suggested by credible sources. Hopefully, by the end of this video, you will be able to decide for yourself who killed Aung San. Part 1. Usa. A little after 10.30 a.m. on July 19th, 1947, a single jeep carrying armed gunmen in military fatigues drove into the courtyard of the Secretariat building, where Aung San was having a meeting with his new cabinet. There was no wall or gate protecting the government building, and although Aung San had been warned that someone may have been plotting to kill him, the sentries guarding the building did not challenge or stop the car in any way. Four men from the car, armed with three Tommy guns, a Sten gun, and grenades, ran up the stairs toward the council chamber, shot the guard standing outside, and burst into the council chamber. The gunman shouted, Remain seated, don't move! Aung San stood up and was immediately shot in the chest, killing him. The gunman sprayed the area where he was standing with gunfire for approximately 30 seconds, killing four other council members immediately and mortally wounding another three. Only three men in the room survived. The eight other people who died in Aung San's assassination were among the most promising political leaders in Burma. Takin Mia was a minister without portfolio who had been a student leader and a close friend of Aung San. Ba Cho, the Minister of Information, had been the editor of a prominent nationalist journal. Abdul Razak, a Tamil Muslim, the Minister of Education, had been a headmaster. Ba Win, the Minister of Trade, was Aung San's older brother. Manba Kang, the Ministry of Industry, was one of the few Karen politicians not to have boycotted involvement in the new government. Sao San Tun, the Minister of the Hill Regions, was a Shan prince who had taken an active lead in convincing the other ethnic minorities to join Burma in becoming independent. On Mong was a Deputy Minister in the Ministry of Transportation who had just entered the conference room to deliver a report before the assassination. Abdul Razak's 18-year-old bodyguard, Ko Twe, was killed before the gunman entered the room. Burma's last pre-World War II Prime Minister, Usa, who had himself lost an eye surviving an assassination attempt in late 1946, was arrested for the murders the same day. The most apparent motive for Usa's alleged involvement in Aung San's assassination was that Usa had blamed either Aung San or someone in his inner circle for the recent attempt on his life. A suspicion that had apparently deepened after Aung San, when visiting Usa in the hospital, was only able to give an ambiguous answer when asked whether he knew who was responsible. The evidence indicating that Usa committed Aung San's murder included a phone call that had been recorded on a phone which had been tapped by the local police, in which Usa had said that he wanted Aung San dead. Following Usa's arrest, a search of his property uncovered a stash of rifles and machine guns in airtight containers hidden at the bottom of a lake in his property, showing that he seemed to have the means to have committed the assassination. The British themselves identified and tried the officers within the British Army who they believed had sold the weapons to Usa. Part 2. The British this evidence alone was sufficient to have Usa tried and hanged for his responsibility in Aung San's assassination. But there have been many other claims of responsibility from multiple parties ever since Aung San's death. Some claimed that a rogue faction in the British intelligence service was responsible. In his autobiography, one of the 30 comrades, General Cha Za, accused the British police department in Rangoon of knowing about Usa's plot days in advance but doing nothing to prevent it. Other observers blamed discontented senior members of the Burmese army, claiming it was inconceivable that Usa, a man with no military experience, could have planned and carried out the attack alone. The Burmese Communist Party said that it was part of 
an imperialist plot claiming that Aung San had been in discussion with them to form a united front government and that the assassination had been carried out to prevent this. Usa never admitted any responsibility and he claimed that the weapons found behind his house, which led to his conviction, had been planted in order to frame him. Usa's claim was believed by multiple other politicians who were not part of Aung San's party, the most senior of which was Uba Pei, who stated to the press that they also expected to be framed for other crimes by their enemies and the new government. After Aung San died, his old friend Unu became the Prime Minister and stated publicly that he knew the British were not involved in the assassination. According to General Cha Za, this was evidence that in fact Unu was part of the conspiracy. A variation on the theory that the British were involved in Aung San's assassination was given new life in an influential but sensationalist documentary broadcast by the BBC on the 50th anniversary of his assassination in 1997. This documentary investigated the fact that several low-ranking British officers had sold firearms to a number of Burmese politicians, including Usa. Shortly after Usa's conviction, Captain David Vivian, a British Army officer, was sentenced to five years imprisonment for supplying Usa with the weapons. Vivian was freed from prison when Karen soldiers captured Insane Prison in May 1949. According to General Cha Za, he then lived with the Karen people in Kaukarek, in the mountains of eastern Burma, until 1950, when he traveled back to Thailand and then to England, where he lived until his death in 1980. Little information about his motives was revealed either during or after the trial, as he never gave a full account of his actions at the time of, or at any time following, his arrest. Kin Ung the son of the deputy police inspector who arrested Usa claimed that Usa bought the arms found at his house from the black market after they had been sold by British officers, not by the soldiers directly. Kin Ung claimed that the arms, before being smuggled into the black market, were in the process of being transported to Singapore in preparation for their withdrawal from Burma. So Usa's possession of these weapons wasn't necessarily evidence of British complicity in Aung San's murder, but rather the greed of the individual soldiers. He identified the officer responsible for selling the arms as Major Lance Dane, but claimed that Dane and his associates were later secretly released after being imprisoned. Kin Ong claimed that the name of one of Aung San's assassins was Yanji Ong, though nobody by that name was ever arrested or tried for the crime. Other than the crime of selling arms on the black market, no other evidence seems to implicate the British. By 1947, the local British government had actively promoted Aung San as the future leader of Burma, partially in an effort to keep the communists from taking power, and his arrest had been actively opposed in private meetings by the most senior British military staff in 1946 as being potentially destabilizing to the region. So, there doesn't seem to have been any motivation for the British political or military leadership of the colony to have wanted Aung San dead. Who else could have been responsible for Aung San's assassination? Part 3 In the final years of the British administration of Burma, Aung San became good friends with the second last governor of Burma, Colonel Sir Reginald Dorman Smith, an Anglo-Irishman with whom he would regularly discuss his personal difficulties. In early 1946, approximately a year before his death, Aung San complained to Dorman Smith while eating dinner together that he felt melancholic, that he did not feel close to his old friends in the Burmese military, that he had many enemies, and that he was worried that someone close to him would attempt to assassinate him soon. The candid admission of Aung San to Dorman Smith that he suspected one of his closest comrades of wanting to assassinate him, made only months before his assassination, raises the possibility that Aung San's murderer might not have been a foreign agent or a rogue politician, but instead a high-ranking member of the Burmese military who might have held a grudge against Aung San and who would have benefited from Aung San's death. But, was there anybody at the time with these characteristics and who also had the means to carry out such an assassination? Shortly before her arrest in 1988, Aung San's daughter, Aung San Suu Kyi, told a foreign reporter that Aung San had warned his comrades not to trust Ne Win only weeks before his assassination. 
She hinted that Nguyen might have been involved in her father's assassination, but that nobody in Burmese politics was comfortable with publicly accusing him. According to Aung San Suu Kyi, Aung San never intended for the Burmese military to be involved in politics, and if he had survived would have limited the influence of its leaders. This criticism was similar to the criticisms of Cha Zha, who in 1976 claimed that, before his assassination, Aung San was seriously considering removing Ne Win from office due to his actions under the Japanese, which led Aung San to worry that Ne Win had fascist tendencies. According to Cha Zha, Aung San had disliked Ne Win since the time they trained together in Hainan when he criticized Ne Win's tendency for cunning and political calculation and for his habits of gambling, drinking, and womanizing. Aung San's dislike of Ne Win increased after the Japanese occupied Burma when Ne Win tortured prisoners in cooperation with the Japanese secret police. In the 1950s, one foreign diplomat recalled that Ne Win was still very jealous of Aung San. And as late as 1986, the Karen National Union published an article suggesting that Ne Win may have been involved in the assassination. The first detailed telegram to London from the governor following the assassination noted that the gunmen were from the 4th Burma Rifles under Ne Win's command, though this was not reported publicly afterwards. Ne Win was briefly detained following the assassination at a checkpoint while driving to a military base north of Yangon, but quickly released and never seriously investigated. Several decades after Aung San's assassination in 1968, Ne Win successfully assassinated Aung San's brother-in-law, Tan Tun, so he was subsequently recorded as having carried out other assassinations. Besides Aung San, most of his cabinet, and U Sa, there were a number of other assassinations and attempted assassinations carried out against other men who had been close to Aung San at the time, whose assassins were never caught, which continued after U Sa's arrest. Two of these included Aung San's English lawyer, Frederick Henry, who was murdered in his house, and F. Collins, a private detective who was investigating Aung San's assassination. According to General Cha Zha, these murders were evidence that somebody was trying to cover up their involvement in the assassination. In September 1948, nine months after Burma's independence, someone assassinated Tin Tut, who had been one of Aung San's closest advisors and who had been appointed by him as finance minister. Tin Tut had survived the secretariat assassination because, like U Nu, he could not attend the meeting but his assassin made up for the failure to assassinate him the first time by throwing a grenade into his car at a stoplight. Tin Tut's assassin was never caught, and nobody was ever charged with his murder. It was rumored that he was investigating Aung San's assassination at the time of his death. The continuing pattern of political assassinations that began before Aung San's assassination and which continued after U Sa's arrest point to the possibility that U Sa was, at least, not the primary actor in Aung San's assassination. Someone powerful was continuing to use violence as a political weapon and to keep the public from knowing the truth about Aung San's assassination following U Sa's arrest. The person who had the most power to do all these things who had a recorded history of political violence, including assassination, who had a history of animosity with Aung San, and who benefited the most from Aung San's assassination, was his old friend and comrade, Ne Win. Thank you for watching. In our next and final video on the biography of Aung San, we will examine his legacy. How generations of Burmese people have interpreted the life of Aung San from the time of his death to the modern age, and how his memory has continued to affect the popular culture of Myanmar. If Kin Ung ever finds this video, I'm sorry for stealing the name of your book. I will pay you the royalties if requested.